Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Today, I want to welcome Hannah to our mini podcast series. Hannah is the mother of a four-year-old boy who has had difficulty swallowing since birth. Hi, Hannah. Thank you for joining us today to share your journey. Can you start by sharing a memory or difficult experience related to your son's swallowing disorder? Sure. So it's not really one isolated experience. It's more that probably for the first, I don't know, almost full full year of his life, I just felt like nobody was listening to my concern. And that includes my pediatricians who, I mean, the, the specific things that I was concerned about were he seemed to be having a lot of trouble nursing. However, he completely refused to take bottles. And whenever I could get him to take anything, he would struggle with it a lot. And the whole situation was compounded by the fact that about six weeks after he was born, everyone went into COVID shutdown mode. Mm -hmm. So it was impossible to actually access anyone in person for help. And thankfully, my pediatrician's offices were still open. However, they did not know anything about this. And unfortunately, um, my experience with them was of just like total ignorance and kind of dismissiveness towards my concerns to the extent that actually when I finally, finally, finally got a feeding therapist who I was consulting with virtually um, and an ENT who I had actually seen in person to kind of discuss the idea of my son getting a swallow study the pediatrician was completely dismissive and said, and, and basically intimated that I was being neurotic because my son's weight had been good and got them to call it off. And that was probably like the worst feeling for me. Yeah. That it was just, she felt like I was just being neurotic. Oh, I'm um, sorry. That's awful. And it took us like another six months before we got a swallow study. Wow. So that actually had an impact on. You know, thankfully, I, I don't think at the end of the day, we were very lucky. His aspiration resolved completely on its own, although he still has dysphagia. But I mean, that lost us about six months of that knowledge. And that wasn't the worst reaction I got. But I think that left me feeling the worst. Like I just had encounter after encounter with medical professionals, pediatricians, um, lactation consultants, feeding therapists. ENTs, GIs, who were completely dismissive. I'm sorry for um, that experience. It was awful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. To be dismissed by all these medical providers when you knew that something was wrong and nobody knows their kiddos like a parent does. And so it, we were talking before this podcast that this is your, your second child. And so you knew something was different than with yeah. your first and being dismissed is so frustrating. And during COVID too, where that was already a time of heightened anxiety, I'm sure that this brought a lot of frustration, a lot of worries, a lot of isolation to you when you yeah. were trying so hard to advocate for, for you and your son to get services and to get a proper assessment to figure out what was going on. How did you cope during those days? Um, well, I was lucky because I think Every, I mean, I was very attached to my phone at that point because it was like my connection to the outside world. <laughs> and um, so I was spending a lot of time on WhatsApp in particular, like community WhatsApp groups. And at some point I just started getting kind of desperate when I felt like no one was listening to me. And so I just started asking like questions about feeding issues on community groups mm -hmm. Um and I was lucky because I reached someone, an acquaintance who I didn't realize previously did have experience as a feeding therapist. And she was able to help guide me to some extent, although she recommended advocating for a swallow study, which didn't go so well afterward. But it was it was very helpful for, for me to feel that validation at the mm -hmm. beginning, um, even though there were you know limitations in how much she could help me. Sure. Um, and... I think through that, I also ended up connecting with someone who actually ended up being a neighbor that I did not know and has oh. subsequently moved, whose son also had dysphagia, wow. which was crazy. And that was a ve she was a very helpful resource. And she pointed me toward Columbia, which is like the first time someone took me seriously. The first time any medical professional took me seriously at a hospital was at Columbia. But it took us like, I don't know, you know, nine months of 
contacting various professionals to get to that point. Part of it is that they didn't reopen except for emergencies until, I don't know, maybe like six months afterward, sure. after the COVID shutdown started. Mm -hmm. Like it was mm -hmm. months and months later. So those those people were both very helpful. And the second person who had sought feeding help for her son through Columbia, she also told me to get on Facebook groups. She said that, that it was a very, very, it was very beneficial to her. And, and it was very, very helpful to me. So I, I found the swallowing group. And later when there was a suspicion of laryngeal cleft, I got on the laryngeal cleft group mm -hmm. and they were both very helpful to me. Um, it was sort of like a combination of feeling validated and also like being able to access so many different people who had similar experiences and whatever their doctors had told them. Mm -hmm. Because frankly, my trust for a lot of medical professionals went down a lot. And I just realized, especially when we're talking about something very rare in the pediatric population, it's better to talk to a lot of people and see what their doctors are saying. So I could get a sense of like, what is the actual consensus around this? Or like, where are the breakdowns? Like, what what is going on here? Because I just felt like I couldn't trust the people I was speaking to because they just were not knowledgeable, mm -hmm. um, especially at the beginning. I mean, eventually I found people who were more knowledgeable, but it was it was mostly by, like, asking a million questions on these groups yeah. um, and having, like, a bajillion private conversations with various people who were very helpful to me um, on these groups. That's, that's how I accessed helpful information. It really mm -hmm. wasn't through the hospitals. It mm -hmm. wasn't through the professional. And also another organization that helped me was, um, feeding matters. Mm -hmm. They have, uh, I can't remember the name of the program exactly, but it was like a peer, it was like a peer pairing program. They paired me with somebody who's son had also had feeding issues a little bit different i think he had had eoe and he had a lot of like like he was just rejecting food for a while after all his distress associated with that and um he was in feeding therapy for years and years and years but the person i was speaking to was really helpful because she had kind of come out on the other side of that her child was much older he was doing fine and she had also just navigated a lot of the same you know, she had dealt with like the air digestive teams and she had dealt with all these hospital personnel and she had advocated and advocated for her child. Mm -hmm. so she was able to give me a lot of good advice and it also was just, it gave me some hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was very, very helpful to me. Good. Yeah, what I'm hearing is that connecting with community, people who understand what you're going through on a personal level has been really supportive to you. Yeah, 100%. And, and to feel validated that you're not the only one going through this and to get tips and information from others is, is valuable. And, yeah. you know, it's exhausting and being a parent of a, a young child is exhausting in itself. And then when you're having to navigate all this new stuff, um, it, it's challenging. Can I ask how your son is doing now? Um, thank God he's doing really well. Um, like I said, we were very lucky. His aspiration like resolved spontaneously, which apparently is not so unusual. Like they really don't understand it mm -hmm. very well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he still is just weak in terms of his oral motor muscles. He's still not the most efficient chewer. He's still overstuffs. He's still, you know, he eats safely. Thank goodness. He's been eating safely for a long time, but it's more a matter of kind of just like making him more aware of what's going on in his mouth and making him more efficient. And he's also learning. He's made a lot of progress this year, actually learning how to drink from an open cup, which was very, very challenging for him. And it's still not, you know, his main mode of drinking, but he's getting closer. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy about that. Excellent. That's great to hear some progress. I'm glad that he's doing well this year. Um, any parting words of wisdom, anything that you would like to share with our community? Um, I mean, I think really just what I said before, I think the most important thing is to, the thing that got me through this was connecting with other people who were going through it. Mm -hmm. It was not speaking to medical professionals. Mm -hmm. It was finding people who were going through it. Um, and I think that's, that's like the, just the most, it, it was, it was, the, I don't have the words to express how helpful it was mm -hmm. and how it helped me get through, you know, some very challenging times. So that would be my advice. Excellent. 
Well, Hannah, thank you for sharing that. I'm so glad that you connected with others and that was helpful to you. I appreciate you sharing your experiences and your insights with us, um, your strength, your resilience. It's inspiring um, from one mother to another. Uh, raising children, especially when navigating uncharted waters, it takes superhuman strength. So kudos to you. And again, thank you for participating in this. For sure.